right, welcome back. This is CS50, and this is the end of week seven. So, one of these stupid little things that goes around the internet, it, we slurped up, and it should now make a little bit of geeky sense to you. Well, it's funnier to this guy than it was to you guys. So, okay. So, um, speaking of,、uh, well, guys,、um, today is Nate's birthday. So, we got. Woohoo, Nate! <laughs> so, to give you a sense of、um, just how good Nate and I are at web development based on Monday's class and based now on this, I thought I'd pull up Nate's homepage if you haven't seen it yet. This here is Nate's HTML.、Um, so, see his source code if you'd like to see how to do this. And, Nate, if we, if we could embarrass you just briefly, the staff got you a little something. If you'd like to share some desserts with some of the kids in the class here, if you'd like to come on down. Woo! Now, you all applaud and are very nice, but no one is sitting anywhere near Nate for some reason in that back zone. So, perhaps.、Uh, You can find some folks to enjoy these with you. Happy birthday, Nate. Aw,、oh, thanks. Woo! All right, so.、Um Additional hellos. So, you, we showed a couple clips from our CS50X students. If you would like to see who else it is in the world that's following along, you can head to this URL where Joseph, one of our TFs, has put together a montage of sorts of everyone who's been submitting these videos,、uh, among them Rick Astley. And if you scroll through these, it's actually really quite inspiring to see just the diversity of countries and cities from which people are hailing. So, if you'd like to take a look at that, that will be up through the end of the semester. So, today we continue our look at the web. Web programming, HTML, and the like. And we also、um, have lunch coming up this Friday if you would like and have particularly have not done so before. This Friday's theme will be Nate's birthday. So if you would like to have birthday lunch with Nate and others, some of our friends from industry, please head to that URL there. Space, as always, is limited. Also, if you've forgotten, realize that next week is the deadline for problem set for scavenger hunt, whereby after recovering all of those JPEGs from card.raw, you and your section mates, if you would like, can try photographing as many. Of the computer scientists from that memory card as possible, and you and your section will then win a fabulous prize. Refer back to PSET 4's specification as to what to submit and by when. Also, if you would like to have your handiwork immortalized on the course's website, And its history of apparel.、Um, know that you're welcome now to start submitting designs for this year's t shirts and sweatshirts and the like.、Um, we'll do our best to include as many as we can, but we'll have some members of the staff review all of the designs to make sure they're consistent with、uh, the specifications. And we then pick generally、uh, a handful of them to be exhibited. So if you're the design type, just know that the requirements for graphics are pings, at least 200 dpi. They shouldn't be more than 4,000 by 4,000 pixels and no more than 10 megabytes, but you're welcome to use things like Photoshop. Shop or GIMP or various graphics programs, whatever you have at your disposal. Also on the horizon is the final project. So, the final project really is the climax of 50, whereby Of all of the assignments in the course, it's your opportunity really to do your own thing. And that can be simply to do something for fun. It can be to solve some pressing problem your student group has for some new website, some new collection mechanism for data. It can be a mobile application for Android, for iOS. Really, the sky is the limit. And over the next few weeks, as we transition from C to these higher level languages like PHP and JavaScript, you'll find yourself increasingly、uh, familiarized with some real world techniques, some real world tools. And to supplement that, know that the course has a history of Of seminars, whereby over the next several weeks, some of the teaching staff and friends of ours from on campus will offer optional seminars which go above and beyond what's typically done in section to introduce you things like Android programming, to introduce you to things like iOS programming or more advanced web development techniques. There's a whole history of these already online. If you go to cs50.net slash seminars,、um, we've been doing this for quite some years, quite,、uh, quite a many years right now, and you'll see that archived here with PDFs and videos and the like. Is several dozen videos of seminars. Last year, for instance, we had a seminar on acing your technical interviews. If you're actually looking to go off and do an internship or full time gig,、um, Windows Mobile Development, Android Development, Google Maps, API, CSS, for the,、uh, developing for the BlackBerry, Emacs. Really,、uh, you are welcome to take a look 
at any of these seminars at your convenience. And we'll be、uh, holding some new ones this semester as well. So, what is ahead with the final project? Well, first, even though this date is somewhat imminent, this is really just an opportunity to start thinking about the final project.、Um, quite、uh, realistically, we know only the beginnings of some of what we'll still be covering in the course HTML, PHP, and the like. But you're all familiar with the web, and I bias this conversation toward the web only because most people end up doing web based final projects, but that is by no means requisite. Using C Is fine. Objective C, Java, any other language you might know or want to know is quite fine. But to get the juices flowing, initially we'll expect this submission of a pre proposal, which, per the PDF on the website, which is now at cs50.net, and at the top left you'll see final project is the specification for the final project. And in there are details on the pre proposal and the like. It pretty much boils down to an email to your teaching fellow just to strike up a conversation with him or her about what you're thinking.、Um, Projects.cs50.net is a repository of ideas from folks on campus if you're struggling to come up with some idea. And at manual.cs50.net slash APIs is a repository of links to APIs. What though is an API? What's an API? Said it. At least twice, according to the transcripts of the past several weeks. What's that? OK, a y good. So, something programming interface, application programming interface. And this can take several forms, but what this really boils down to is code that someone else has written or data that someone else has collected that is made available to you in some programmatic way. You can write code in C, PHP, Python, Ruby, whatever your language of choice typically is, and you can somehow build upon someone else's functionality or someone else's data set. For instance, if I go to this link here, And you'll see a pair of links on the subsequent page whereby we have CS50's own APIs, which are very Harvard centric, and then third party APIs. Among the third party APIs are really useful things like being able to send SMSs to people, being able to receive SMS text messages from people, and things like that that you might have no idea how to implement yourself, but thanks to services, some free, some commercial, you can. Build atop those and do something of interest to you. Among CS50's APIs are these campus centric things like Harvard courses, energy, events, food, maps, news, tweets, and Shuttleboy's own. And these are APIs that look a little something like this. Let me pull up the Harvard Food API.、Um, if you've ever been to HUDS's website, you've probably been there to just see what's for dinner or to see what the hours are for some D Hall. Well, it's not particularly easy to navigate. And so, what we did some time ago is we wrote software, happens to be in PHP, that actually screen scrapes the entirety of HUDS's website. To screen scrape something means to write a program in a language like PHP that pretends to be a browser, even though you might run it at a command prompt. That pretends to be a browser, connects to a website, downloads its HTML, the language in which it's written, and then reads it, or more specifically, parses it top to bottom, left to right. And what we did was we wrote our code in such a way that anytime we saw something in that HTML that looked like something on the menu, like hamburger, we would then import that into our own database. And anytime we saw nutritional content, we would import that into our own database. And what we did was leverage the fact that HUDS's website, even though it might be a bit of a、uh, A challenge for us humans to navigate underneath the hood, all of the HTML is generated by their own computer programs. And so, all of their HTML, even though it might look messy like most websites underneath the hood, it follows a pattern. So, we just spent a couple hours figuring out that pattern so that in the end, we throw away all of the messy HTML, all of the aesthetics of bold facing and italics and the like. And what we are then able to do. Is expose that same data, for instance, in this way. So, we, according to the documentation here, have informed the world that if you request a URL that looks like this food.cs50.net slash something, and you provide certain parameters, which we'll talk about today, like、uh, end date time, start date time, meal, and so forth, what our servers will return to you, for instance, is a CSV file, comma, separated val、uh, values, like a, an Excel file, containing everything for breakfast on this particular date、uh, in March of last year when I happened to write up this document. 
documentation. For those familiar, CSV is not the only file format. There's another format that's all the more、uh, versatile called JSON, JavaScript object notation. The data can come back in that format. So the takeaway here is that whether you dive into this API or any other of CS50s or anything out there on the internet, or none at all, realize that the world has increasingly started to standardize how machines intercommunicate. We use standard data formats like CSV or JSON. And what this means for you is you can write the interesting part of a program that lets a user search a dining hall menu, that lets them create lists of favorites, that lets them get text alerts when their favorite meal is about to be served in some D hall by using someone else's data set and building up top their API. So, more on that、um, uh, in the form of seminars and the documentation that you have here online. So, those then are APIs. So, that brings us back to HTML. So, quick recap what is HTML? Good. Hypertext markup language. Someone else. What is hypertext markup language? Hypertext markup language. <laughs> okay. So HTML, hypertext. So hypertext just refers to the web for the most part. Markup means that it's not actually a programming language, HTML. It's not a language that you can express logic in. It doesn't have loops. It doesn't have conditions. It doesn't have functions per se. Rather, it has these things called tags, or more properly, elements. And those elements have start tags and end tags, or open tags and close tags. And what those tags generally mean for a browser is start doing something and then stop. Doing something. Though there are exceptions to that, sometimes it's just put a line break here, for instance. And we saw examples of that the other day between bold facing, line breaks, and then a couple of other tags. So HTML is the language in which web pages are written. So if I go to something like google.com and pull up just their home page, Recall that if you right click or、uh, control click and look at view page source, typically it's a complete mess these days underneath the hood, but that's because computers don't care about white space, so this doesn't have to look pretty. But if we zoom in on parts of it, notice that Chrome, just to be nice, has color coded things. And indeed, this is the very first. Tag that we saw in a web page. And again,、uh, HTML5, the latest version of this language, does have this thing at the beginning、uh, open bracket, bang, doc type HTML, whether lowercase or uppercase. But that's just sort of a standard that says, hey world, here comes an HTML file in version 5. The interesting part begins here. So open bracket HTML. And then there were two children of the HTML elements last time. What were those two main children? So, head and body, just like the guy with the tattoo a moment ago, there's two portions of a web page, head and body. And recall then that perhaps the simplest web page we could make looks like this. And I've indented it just to be kind of、uh, neat and tidy with my code. But what's really important here is that there is some hierarchy to this. And any tag that I've opened, I have closed, and that there's therefore this symmetry. To all of the markup that I've created. So last time we started writing web pages on my own laptop. I opened up TextEdit, I saved the file as like hello.html, I then dragged the file onto my browser, and voila, I had a page on the internet. Now, it's not quite the case. I had a page on my hard drive, and I was literally the only person in the world who could see that web page、uh, in a browser. So today we introduce an actual web server and the notion of actually serving content on the internet and how this all starts to fit together.、So It turns out that all this time in the CS50 appliance, you have had a web server on your computer. We have, in fairness, only used it for gedit, for clang, for gdb, and the like, but also installed by us for you in the appliance. Is a web server. And that web server happens to be free and open source, one of the most popular ones in the world called Apache, or its more technical name is HTTPD, the D being for daemon here, which is a technical word for a server. So installed in the CS50 appliance is a web server. And what does that mean? Well, a web server, as you know, sort of conceptually, is some server on the internet that serves up web content. When asked for a file, it spits out the HTML that composes that file, and voila, you see some. Website's home page. But a server is actually more precisely a piece of software. It doesn't have to be on a physical machine, it just has to be a piece of software running. So the CS50 appliance, of course, is a piece of software, even though it's sort of pretending to be a machine. It's pretending to be a computer inside of a computer. But that just means that the appliance can certainly run things like 
web servers. It can actually run email servers. We could run an instant messaging server in the appliance if we wanted to. And indeed, we do run one other type of server known as a database server, MySQL, but more on that next week. So this means that I can actually visit web pages inside of my appliance by using a browser inside the appliance or even on my own. Laptop, my Mac, or my PC. So, what does this mean? Well, it turns out that anytime you're running a Linux computer, its nickname is quote unquote localhost, right? It doesn't have a domain name because we haven't bought a domain name for something like the appliance, so its default name is localhost. But in order to get the appliance to start serving up web pages, we have to actually create them first. So, let's do that. Let me go into a terminal window here. And notice that I'm at my typical John Harvard prompt. Let me go ahead and type ls, and we'll see some familiar things from this semester desktop, downloads, Dropbox, and so forth. But now we start turning our attention to a couple. At, on many Linux web servers, there's this folder called public HTML, but we're going to skip that one for now and focus on this vhosts. Anyone know what a vhost is? Just stupid jargon for virtual host. And what this means is that on a typical server, You can actually host multiple websites. You can buy a domain name like foo.com and you can host it on a server. But you can also buy bar.com and host it on the same server. The reason being, browsers are smart enough to inform the server when a user is requesting some web page what domain name the user wants. The home page for. So, what's nice about this is you don't need one physical server or one CS50 appliance for every website you might want to create. You can actually use the same server and develop 100 different websites. And indeed, if you are a person trying to start a website, whether for fun or for business, typically you'll go out on the internet and you'll pay someone 10 bucks a month, $100 a month to host your website for you. And that hap that, the way that works is they are charging、uh, other people 10 bucks a month or 100 bucks a month to host the other people. Websites on their same server. And the reason they can do that is because of this feature called vhosts. But more on that、uh, when it comes time for final projects. For now, let's just dive in there. So cd vhosts. And if I type ls now, notice that there's a folder in there called localhost. That's because by default, the appliance figures you're only going to ever run one website on an appliance. This isn't really the real world, it's not a real world web server. So let me go into localhost. And now we'll see in there one last directory called HTML. So it's a little deep, the hierarchy, but if and when you decide to start developing multiple websites over the next you know, n months or years, this kind of folder structure tends to be helpful. So now let's go into HTML as I just did, type ls, and nothing is there. So now let's go ahead and do this. Let me open up Chrome inside of the appliance, and let me go to http colon slash slash localhost. So literally the name for my appliance. Enter. And I get index of slash. So this isn't working, this isn't really showing me anything of interest, but it turns out that we can start, what we're seeing is that folder, HTML. There's nothing inside that folder right now. So instead, what I'm going to have to do is first create a file, create an HTML file like we did on Monday, but this time put it inside of the appliance. Now, for those of you who are、uh, trying to follow along with laptops now, let me do one aside that'll be covered in the、uh, web based P set. But in order to get this to work for the very first time, you're going to have to run this command sudo service httpd. Start. And this again will be repeated in the、uh, last P set, but if you're playing along at home now, the web server by default is turned off in the appliance, and that's so that it doesn't sap up RAM and memory for seven weeks out of the semester when we don't need it. So you need to run this command once, and you'll get an output like that. Then you should be able to play along here. All right, so now let's go back into this folder. So this folder is empty, so let me start creating a file gedit hello.html. All right, gedit is open as usual. Let me do doc type HTML, HTML. Let me get ahead of myself and start closing my tags in advance. Now I have the head. Let me go ahead and close the head. Let me now do the title of the page Hello World, like last time. Close title. Now let me do a body. In here I'll say Hello World with some exclams to make clear that it's a different string. Close body. And now let me go ahead and file save. Let me go back to my terminal window. And if I type ls, I should presumably see hello.html. And I do. So now let's go back to my browser, click reload, and you can see 
we're indeed inside of this HTML folder. I'm not seeing a web page yet. This is Apache, the web server, just showing me the list contents of this directory, just like Mac OS or Windows would typically do on your own local hard drive. So if I want to see this web page, I can click this little link here hello.html. And indeed, that's what I was expecting to see. Now, again, this is not a URL that any of you can visit right now, because for you, localhost, if you have a laptop here, is referring to your own instance of the appliance. This is on my own personal appliance. But this was kind of dumb for me to have to have a user like myself click on hello.html to actually see the contents of this page. So it turns out that web servers like Apache actually let you have、uh, a default file for any. A、uh, web server. So notice here we have hello.html. What's the command in Linux to rename a file? MV, so, so for move. So let me do that and let me rename hello.html to index.html. Let me type ls to confirm. It's now been renamed. Now this is going to,、uh, if I go back now to localhost, notice now. That I'm automatically seeing that web page. This is identical to my actually doing slash index.html. But the nice thing now is that the web server is figuring oh, if you have a file that by human conventions called index.html, let me show the user that file by default rather than some stupid directory listing, which is not at all user friendly. Indeed, most websites you visit on the internet don't have a list of files to click on, they just show you the contents. So that's how we can do that index.html. All right, so this is all fine and good, but this is a pretty simple web page. Let me go ahead and open up now index.html. In my vhosts, localhosts, HTML directory. And let's actually add something of greater interest. So there's hello world. Let's instead say、uh, this is CS50, Harvard Colleges, dot, dot, dot. OK, so the、uh, beginning of the course catalog description of some sort there. So now if I reload, I should see this in my home page. OK, and I do see that. But suppose that I want to now list some more content in this file. So I could go down here and say、um, prerequisites none, although some of you are probably like, ha ha ha, no prerequisites.、Um, but officially, so reload. And now we have the same quirk that we saw last time. But why is that? It was a simple fix. Why is this page broken? Yeah, so we've solved this before by explicitly telling the browser, put a line break here. And that's because, again, a browser is only going to do explicitly what the markup language tells it to do. So even though you might have hit enter once or twice or even 10 times, it's going to just kind of combine that all into a single space just by convention. So if you really want a line break, you have to use the br tag. And now notice, like Monday, I actually put the slash inside of this tag only because this. Just doesn't feel right to start a line break, then stop it with nothing in between. So, the convention in HTML is to open and close a tag simultaneously. As an aside, you'll see a lot of websites and books not doing that.、Um, it is correct to do or not to do it, but we would argue that design wise and stylistically, this is just better because then every tag is both opened and closed somehow. So, now let's save and reload, go back to the browser. OK, a y so now we're making some progress, but it's not quite enough. Let's go ahead and start typing in、um, some longer body of text. So let's actually say、uh, a quick brown fox jumps over a lazy dog. And now let me just copy and paste this a few times. So we have a paragraph of text. Let me go back over here. OK, a y so it's not looking very good. I do have a line break, so it's OK. a y But now, once we're getting to the point of having a web page that has lots of content, not just single lines to demonstrate HTML, we can start to think of these things as actual paragraphs. And we can start to structure our web page a little more cleanly. And indeed, what I can do is go up here inside of my body tag. And you know what? If this is CS50 dot 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 really demarks the beginning of a paragraph, well, let's tag it as such. Let me indent the text just by convention. Let me say that this paragraph ends here. And then rather than And do this line break, let me actually just say that this belongs there and as a new paragraph. And I'll just quickly indent by just clobbering all of this stuff. So now we have an indented paragraph there. And so now our markup is starting to get a little more semantically. Uh, consistent with what we're trying to do. We have a paragraph, so let's call it a paragraph with the p tag. We have a second paragraph, so let's call it a paragraph with the p tag. And now, what the browser will typically do by convention is just like in an English book or essay, where you typically see some line breaks between paragraphs, browsers will do that for you 
automatically. So now we have two paragraphs and we can sort of continue this. But of course, on the web, when you have bodies of text, it's not typically just huge blobs of text. There's often hyperlinks in there. So if we want to, for instance, include some links there, suppose what might be of interest in whatever web page I'm creating here is let me go to google.com and let me search for a quick brown fox. Go to Google Images. And how about this is cute? We'll go with this. So here we have a quick brown fox jumping over a lazy dog. So, what I'm going to do here, just for the sake of demonstration, is suppose that this image was actually on my server and I had been creating these images. What I just did was right click or control click on the image. Whoops. And what you'll see in most browsers. Is a little menu, stop doing that, a little menu that allows you to choose copy、uh, link location or copy URL. So let me go back now to my HTML and suppose that I actually want to hyperlink this to, a、uh, to another web page. What was the tag called for that? Yeah, so ahref for hyper reference. Let me go ahead and paste that in. It's a pretty long URL, so let me zoom back out. Close bracket. So now notice I'm way over here because that URL happened to be pretty long. Let me scroll over here to the end of quick brown fox and then let me close this tag with open bracket slash a, where I only close the name of the tag. Now let me go ahead and save that file, reload the web page. And now by default, that's going to be underlined in blue for me, but indeed, I can now click on this and voila, there is that image. And it didn't have to be an image. I could actually have linked to some other random website on the internet. I could do this, for instance, with CS50. So, one last example here. This is CS50. Might make sense to go a href equals http colon slash slash www.cs50.net. Close quote, close an、uh, anchor. So, now that's an even shorter URL. And this time, we're not going to link to an image. We're instead going link to link to another page. Now, We have an image here. I feel like we can do a little better than just linking to an image. What if we want to actually embody it in our own web page? Well, what I can instead do here is rather than link to this graphic, let me instead cut the URL and we'll get rid of that hyperlink and just clean this up. And we'll go down here and get rid of this. We don't really need all these sentences now, so let me shorten the page a little bit. And then down here, let me go ahead in a new paragraph say, I don't want text now, I want an image. Whose source is going to be that URL. An image like a line break is either there or it's not. So let me immediately close that tag. And let me go ahead now and close the paragraph that I'm inside. And if all goes well with Hello World, if I reload now, I indeed see right inside my own web page an image. So now we have an image tag, we have an anchor tag, and the like. And for good measure, let me do one other thing that's often neglected on websites these days. Let's also provide some descriptive text for this image for people who are on a mobile device and therefore might not be able to download this image very quickly, for people who are blind and might not be able to see the image, but they might have a screen reader that can tell them what this image is of. And to do that, there's another attribute for image tags called alt for alternative text. And what I can do here and say, this is a A quick brown fox, so that even if the human can't see the image on the screen, he or she can at least hear, as with some piece of software, what actually、um, is out there on the screen. That won't change the aesthetics of the page, but it's certainly good practice for users. All right, so let's leave this web page in its current form. But let's see if we can't now introduce some better approaches to writing these web pages, some lessons that are going to serve us well as our pages get more and more complex. What we're not going to do over the next few weeks is walk、uh, you through all of the several dozen HTML tags that there are, much like in Scratch back in week zero, where it probably sufficed to give a high level overview of some of the concepts, a quick tour of some of the blocks. You were probably able pretty comfortably to navigate on your own the various puzzle pieces. And that's going to happen again in HTML, most likely, whereby there's ample resources. On the web, that will point you at、um, various textbooks if you prefer to read a textbook that will walk you through all of the various things you can do with HTML. But really, we have seen thus far in HTML. Most of the fundamental concepts. We have the notion of tags being open, tags being closed. Some tags that are both opened and closed in the sense that they're empty. There should be nothing inside of them, like an image tag or a line break, which are just there. We also looked already at the notion of an attribute, like alt or source.、Um, notice that these words tend, by convention, to be short and succinct. We do not have discretion over what these things are called. Someone else who invented HTML came up with these names. So you just have to start to know or look up. 
anytime you need them, what the names are for these tags and attributes. And in the case of these attributes, attributes generally modify the behavior of some tag. In this case, the source attribute tells the image tag what the source of the image should be. The href、uh, attribute tells the anchor tag what it should actually be linking to. But in terms of the structure of a web page, even though Facebook and Google and the like are, look like a complete mess underneath the hood at first glance, if you start to read through it more methodically, they all follow this basic, basic. Structure. But we can improve the stylization of these things. So let me actually go to some examples that I prepared in advance. Let me go ahead and copy them from another folder here and put them into this directory. And in advance, what I did was prepared a few files、uh, search 0, search 1, search 2, and search 3 and 4. Let me go ahead and open up the first of those files and let's see if we can't begin to create. Our own search engine. So at the top of this file, as is usually the case in class, just a bunch of comments. In HTML, though, the means by which you start a comment is open bracket, bang, hyphen, hyphen, and then you're inside of a comment, a multi line comment. When you're ready to stop that comment, you can do hyphen, hyphen, close bracket. So everything at the top in blue is just a comment. This is my doc type declaration, which again, you can just copy and paste on faith for now.、Uh, this just tells the browser, here comes some HTML5. Below that on line 14 is the first of my actual tags. And this just says, as before, here comes some HTML. Here comes the head of my page. Here comes the title. And then conversely, that's it for the title. That's it for the head. Here now comes the body of my page. So another, a couple new tags now. H1 stands for heading one. So, there's a tradition in HTML for many years back of having different size,、uh, sizes of text. And back in the day, H1 meant generally just big and bold, but there's also H2, which is big, but not quite as big. And bold. There's H3, which is kind of big, but not nearly as big and bold, and so forth, all the way down to H6. So these days, though, H1, H2, and H3 are really meant to have more semantic meaning to them, whereby H1 is really a heading, the heading of a web page, the heading of a column, or something like that of text. So I've deliberately said H1 CS50 search, close bracket, H1, to specify that this is really the heading, the title of my page, not the title in the title bar sense. But the title that you actually see in the web page itself, in the body. Now, this you can probably guess what it is, even though we have a few new pieces of syntax. This is a form. So the web really gets interesting when websites take input from users. Right? In this class, in the, first pro- in the problem set on web programming, we're not going to make a website per se of static content that shows photographs that you've taken or, woo, this is my resume and things about me, because those things are actually relatively easy to put together. It's hard to make things beautiful on the web, but at least putting up content is pretty trivial. But things get really interesting when someone can visit your website and provide input and can t- fill out forms, can check off checkboxes.、Uh, And can interact with your website. And indeed, probably every website you care about these days in any detail is somehow interactive Facebook, Google, and the like that take user input and produce customized output. So let's start to do that now. Let's transition now from just using HTML for markup of static content as instead a delivery mechanism for dynamic content. And toward that end, let's implement our own search engine. Let's do it as follows here's a form tag. The action attribute specifies that when the user fills out this form with their keyboard, it will be submitted to this URL here. So I'm kind of cheating.、Um, it's going to take us a little longer than one class to implement a whole search engine. So we'll just do the front end, so to speak. We'll do the part that lets the user search and we'll sort of punt to Google the hard part of finding search results. But specifically, I'm going to talk to Google's web server using one of two very popular methods, one being get, another that we'll eventually see being post, although there are others that are less often used. So get just conjures up the idea of I want to get some contents, get some search results. This, you can perhaps guess what this does. This is some kind of input. It's in fact going to look like a text field. And the name of that input, the name of that variable, so to speak, is going to be Q for query by convention. And again, the type of this input is not going to be a checkbox, it's not going to be a menu, it's going to be a text field, as denoted by this attribute here. And this text box, like a line break, is either there or not. So we have an empty element with the slash inside that tag. Then I'm going to put a line break, and you can perhaps guess too what this is going to do. This is another sort of form input. This one's going to be used for submitting the form. So this is going to be the big button that the user can click to actually submit the form. And the label on that button is going to be quote unquote CS50 search. 
close form, close body, close HTML. Let's see what we have in the form of this web page. So let me go to my browser. Let me go still to localhost. This is still index.html. So if I want to see this file called search zero, I can simply do slash search zero dot html, enter, and the first of my mistakes. So what's going on? So I clearly don't have permission to access this file for some reason, but that's because unlike the work we've done thus far in C, where the programs you write are assumed to be runnable, By you, executable by you. That's not really the case on the web, whereby sometimes you might want to create files on a server, but you don't want the whole world to be able to see them. Rather, you want the world to see some files, but not others, just for privacy's sake. So it's more of an opt in basis when you're doing things on the web. And so let me actually type ls here, and you see the files I have. But recall that if I do ls l for long, I'll get a longer listing that gives me some more details about these files that are now really for the first time. Relevant to us. Notice that on the far right are the names of my files and then the time at which they were last modified or copied. This number here is what do you recall? The size in bytes, how big the file is. So I seem to have some kind of logo in here that's bigger than all the other files. This is who I am, this is、uh, what I am, in what group I'm in. But then over here on the left is a bit of cryptic sequence. And we talked, I think, briefly about this in the past, but this has to do with permissions. And even if that's a little hazy, RW probably means read writes. So it turns out that these dashes denote different sets of permissions for different people. And the pattern is essentially as follows. When you see a sequence of dashes here, they look as follows there's a dash, then there's three more dashes, then there's another three, then there's another three. The first one is either a dash or it's a D for directory. So that one's pretty easy. If it's a folder, it says D, otherwise it's a hyphen. There's a couple other cases, but for now we'll just care about files and directories. These next three dashes, and I've、uh, artificially inserted the spaces, they're obviously not there when we saw them a moment ago. These are the file's owner's permissions. And recall from a second ago that it was read writes. That was because I, as the person who created this file a moment ago, I just by default on a Linux computer have the ability to continue reading and writing. That file. So the operating system just gives me RW automatically. The middle ones relate to my group, that of students, which is sort of meaningless on the appliance because I'm the only person using the appliance. So let me just wave my hands at that for now. But the last ones are most important for the web. This is everyone else in the world. And the fact that that is hyphen, hyphen, hyphen means that no one else in the world has any permissions to this file. Clearly a problem. So I need to fix this by somehow giving the world what? Read, write? Feels, that's probably dumb, right? I don't want anyone on the web to be able to visit my page and somehow change that file, even though they really couldn't with an HTML file. But just in principle, probably just want them to be able to read it. What does it mean to read it? Doesn't mean they're going to care about the actual HTML, but the browser needs to be able to parse that markup language, top to bottom, left to right. So someone on the web needs to be able to read it. So I minimally need to give it R. So I can do this in a few different ways, but perhaps the simplest is to run this command here. Chmod, change mode,、uh, then A plus R, so all, everyone in the world, plus read, and then the name of the file, so search 0.html. Now, if I do ls l again, notice that that file has changed, and indeed, I've turned on R for everyone. I've also turned it on for my group, but that's fine, because if I turned it on for my group,、uh, for everyone, my group is a subset of that, so that's fine too. So this just means the computer has now made it readable. Now, let me go back to my browser, click reload. Aha, we now have CS50 search. I've zoomed in a little artificially. Pretty hideous search engine, but let's see if it actually now works. First, let me do a quick sanity check. Let me control click and view page source. Notice that within Chrome, we're now seeing the same HTML that I myself created. Don't get confused here, though. I can't. Start changing the code here because the browser has a read only view of this code. The browser has just asked localhost for a file called search0.html. It is now pure coincidence that the appliance happens to be on the same computer as my browser. I could just have equivalently have typed in www.facebook.com slash search 0.html. And if Facebook had a file called that, I would then be seeing their HTML. And of course, I can't change the file that comes back from Facebook either. So now we're sort of blurring the lines. The appliance is both a server serving up web pages, but it's also a client in the sense that I'm using a browser to actually talk to that server. 
All right, so let's see if my Google search engine works. Let me go ahead and、uh, search for quick brown fox. Enter, and voila, I now have my own search engine. But how does this work? All right, so a bit of a stretch, but, and now you can't see precisely the part that's of interest. Notice what happened. Notice the URL. It turns out that that method called get is super simple. When you specify in a form that you want to get a、uh, result from some server, what it's going to do is take whatever you typed into the form and put it in the URL. It's going to standardize how it gets put in the URL as follows. Notice that this is the URL that was the value of my action attribute. That's where I wanted the form to end up. But then notice this question mark. This is a convention on the web whereby to provide user input to a website, you append to the URL a question mark, and then you have a whole bunch of key value pairs. The name of a key, otherwise known as a parameter in the web, then you have an equal sign, then you have the value of that parameter. So it's essentially a variable name and a variable value, but those variables, names, and values came from the HTML form. Why are the pluses there, do you think? Because I did not type plus in between my words. Yeah, it's just for spacing, right? Odds are, whenever you've seen a URL, there's never any spaces in it. If only because if there were, you couldn't really copy and paste it into an IM or into an email because it would break. You want the whole thing to be one contiguous string of characters. So the browser was smart enough to realize,、mm -mm, don't just put a space there. Let me encode the space in some standard way. And one of the conventions for doing so is to have the browser automatically put a,、uh, a plus where you would otherwise have a space. So now notice, Google has been kind of user. Friendly. I certainly did not create this web page, but they have pre populated their own text field with what precisely I typed in. Suppose I want to search for something else, like a lazy dog. I can just type this here, research. Notice that the URL changes up here, but notice then that I can actually search for anything I want just by understanding how URLs work. I could do lazy cat, enter, and notice now I'm getting a very lazy. Should we? I feel like we should. Again, a very lazy cat. All right, this is one of the stupidest things we've done. But that is a lazy cat. <laughs> OK, a y so anyhow, what's the key takeaway here? So, Now we're sort of playing in the world of HTTP. HTML is just this markup language, open tag, close tag, that tells a browser how to render content on a web page. But when you start transmitting data across the internet between web browser and server, that's where this protocol, known as hypertext transfer protocol, takes over. This is the sort of human convention when Sam and I shook hands on Monday of starting a connection and then closing a connection. Same idea here. So, how then is Is the Google's, how are Google's results coming back to me? How is my form submission going to Google? Well, recall from the other day that what's really going on underneath the hood when you request a web page is your browser is sending a somewhat cryptic message like get slash. HTTP slash 1.1 for the default home page. Or in this case, because I specifically requested earlier search 0.html, this then would be the somewhat cryptic message that my browser sends to the appliance. Or in this case of Google, what's actually sent is a request to slash search and then question mark Q equals,、um, what did we say, lazy cat with a plus there. So, this message that I, the human, am never typing, but is being sent by my browser, this is how HTTP happens. This is the equivalent of our having shaken hands. This is the request, and the server is about to send a response. So, let's take a look at this underneath the hood.、Um, as before, we can open up this special field in a browser. OK. View page、uh, inspect element. So, under inspect element, notice that what's happened in Chrome, and IE and Firefox have similar mechanisms. We have these sort of developer tools accessible to us. Normal people do not use the, these tabs. But we now are interested in what's going on underneath the hood at the network level. So, if I pull up the network level here, let me go ahead and expand this window, open up this entry here, and look at the headers. So, what happens when I request a file from a web server? Is my browser sends a whole bunch of things. And let me view source. So, under request headers, and this is just Chrome showing me some diagnostic output, 
sort of like a debugger of some sort. Notice that what I've highlighted here is precisely what Chrome is sending to the server in order to request a file called search0.html. It is telling the server what it thinks its name is, thanks to this host colon field. Then there's some pretty esoteric stuff in here, like Uh, something to do with dates and times, something to do with the languages that the browser understands. But the really important lines are these first two here. What does the server respond with? Well, if we scroll down here and view source of this thing, notice that the server has responded with a somewhat cryptic message as well 304 not modified. That's a little strange. Let me actually try to fix this. Let me hold down Shift and click Reload up here to force the browser to actually make this request for the first time. Then let me zoom in, and we'll see now that the server's response, because I held Shift, is 200 OK. So you've probably never seen the number 200 in the context of the web, but what numbers have you sometimes seen unexpectedly from a server? 404, file not found. 403, forbidden. 500, server error. So there's these numeric codes that the world uses in the web to signify errors, just like C functions can return errors and main can return exit codes. 200, though, you rarely see because it means all is well. And 304, you probably never see because what is it signifying? That nothing has, let's see if we can simulate this again. Well, now it's not cooperating. 304 said not modified. So, why was the server even responding? Well, for efficiency, a web server automatically for you, if the file hasn't changed, it won't retransmit the whole HTML file. It'll just tell the browser, eh, it hasn't changed. Just use the copy you already have. So, there's this notion of caching on the web for performance so that you don't waste time and waste bandwidth downloading files again and again unnecessarily. But this web page now, Was super simple, and it only、uh, sort of showed me the HTML that came back. Let's actually use the network tab now to do a Google search like quick brown fox. Let me then click CS50 search. And now notice in the bottom here, a whole bunch of stuff came back. Because when I visit a real website like Google.com, they have images, they have text, they have a language called JavaScript there. So every row in this table down here represents something that Google spit out. In response to my single request. So, the one I care about, though, is this first one. And if I go to the search request, click View Source here, notice that indeed the cryptic message that my browser sent to Google were these two lines here, followed by some arcane information down here, which we'll ignore for now. But notice, too, what Chrome is pretty handy with it's also showing me the query string that was sent in. So rather than show me this, which is what was literally sent, if I view it decoded, Chrome, just for debugging purposes, for developers like us, is just showing me a human friendly version of that is not how you spell Fox,、uh, apparently. I'm just noticing this now. But it's showing you literally what I apparently typed. Meanwhile, the response that came back from the server is again 200 OK. But included in that response, of course, if we actually view the page's HTML, Sorry, this is a little keyboard shortcut going awry today.、Nah, I'll deal with this later. So,、um, if we actually view the page's source, which I can do down here by clicking response, this is what was actually spit back in addition to that cryptic 200 OK message from the server. All right, so a little cryptic, but where is all this coming from? Well, let's do one other thing here. So, another somewhat cryptic command, but this one's kind of neat in that. It reveals to us exactly what's going on underneath the hood. So I'm back on my Mac here. I have connected via a program called SSH, Secure Shell, to another server, because most of Harvard's computers block the command we're about to run. Because there's this command on some servers called traceroute that allows you to trace the route between points A and B. And thus far, we've been taking completely for granted that I can type in google.com and somehow get data back from halfway across the country or halfway across the world. With traceroute, we can actually dive in a little deeper as to how the internet works and see. What's going on underneath the hood? So let's go ahead and arbitrarily trace a route to, say, stanford.edu,、uh, which is across the country, and hit enter. And this command can be super fast or super slow, but what we're seeing now, line by line, is every one of these steps or hops between us and、uh, Palo Alto or Stanford, where they have apparently their web server. So, what does each of these lines represent more concretely, though? Piece of jargon from the internet? What's that?、Uh, time. Oh, so there are times, but what does each row, what, is a, what do I mean by hop? Well, there's these things on the internet called 
routers. And routers, as the name suggests, route information from point A to point B. But apparently, there are several points. Beyond A and B, there's C and D and E and F apparently between row one, which happens to be my computer's IP address or my numeric address, which uniquely identifies my computer, and step 15, which is actually the sixth web server apparently, which I'm inferring from this, or version six of their web server at Stanford. But what's kind of neat is we can see the path that my zeros and ones are taking from my computer to Stanford. So step one is my own computer's address. Every computer on the internet has a unique identifier that looks like this. This number, dot number, dot number, dot number. Somewhere on this campus, probably in the Science Center, is a server called, or a router called Core Gateway 2 TE83, whatever that means. So, this is one of Harvard's big fancy routers that routes a lot of the traffic. Here's another of Harvard's routers. This one is Border Gateway. Border meaning it's probably on the periphery of some campus somewhere. Then there's this Knox one, row four, of,、uh, which is Northern Crossroads, which is a big ISP, Internet Service Provider, that places like Harvard、uh, connect up to. But then things get a little interesting. In line six, where are my bits all of a sudden? Kansas. So the world has a habit of using like airport codes and a lot of these things,、um, or at least abbreviations for、uh, states or cities. So it looks like in just 60 milliseconds, a packet of information, zeros and ones, from my laptop got all the way to Kansas, and again, in 60 milliseconds. Moreover, after Kansas, they took a tour through. Houston, probably, as suggested by the name of this server. So, just as a server on the internet can have, must have a numeric address, it can also optionally have a slightly more human friendly address that humans came up with.、Uh, now, in step eight, we don't know what this is. Sometimes routers just kind of ignore you and they just don't answer this question, so that's fine. The one after step eight is apparently where? LA. So, notice in only 78 milliseconds, what takes us humans like six plus hours to do physically takes packets of information on the internet 78 milliseconds to travel that far.、Uh, step 10 is in LA as well. Step 11 seems to have gone north up near Stanford.、Uh, this is their boundary router, our border router. A couple steps at Stanford that, aren't,、uh, that are ignoring us. And then lastly, We reached the web server in just 87 milliseconds. Now, all of these numbers, as an aside, just tell you how long it takes for data to get from me to each of these routers. And it's not accumulative. What this program does is it first sends a message essentially to the first router, then one to the second router, then one to the third router, measuring each time. So, in theory, these times will be growing or at least pretty close to one another. And indeed, the ones that are right here on campus are super small. As soon as you start going across the country, it takes data a little longer to travel, closer to 100 milliseconds, give or take. But let's go the other direction now. How about Cambridge University in the UK? Let me instead run traceroute of www.cam for Cambridge.ac for academic.uk and hit enter here. That was pretty damn fast. So my data literally went to Cambridge, England in that split second of time. So let's see the path that it took. So Harvard, 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 Northern Crossroads, which is an ISP. And then this is Northern Crossroads. And then bam, what is in between steps? Six and seven, router six and seven. Yeah, the Atlantic Ocean.、Um, and we're inferring this from the fact that we go from 20 milliseconds here to 80 milliseconds here. So something took 60 milliseconds, give or take, to get over. And that was probably a big body of water.、Um, so what goes on after that? Well, here we are in London, just 88 milliseconds later. More London, more London. Not sure where this is, but we'll assume it's outside of London, Cambridge here. And finally, we <laughs> literally, University of Cambridge, dot something, dot net. And then Finally, in line 16, their web server is apparently called Scorpius underneath the hood, even though we know it as WWW. So, kind of mind blowing, I think. The first time I ever did this, it totally blew my mind. Unfortunately, Harvard blocks this kind of traffic typically on the network, so you can't do it super easily.、Um, so, realize though, this here is possible. All right, let's take our five minute break here. We'll come back and dive in deeper. All right, so. We are back, and we've kind of、uh, ambled about in a few different directions here. So let's summarize exactly what's been going on here. So we started the conversation talking about this language called HTML. Again, not a programming language, it's just a markup language that's largely about aesthetics and structuring of content in the form of a web page. But HTML, Therefore, need s some kind of mechanism for trans,、uh, traveling between web browser and server. And so, HTML, therefore, sort of rides on top of 
this other language, or more properly, a protocol known as HTTP. And HTTP, as we've seen it thus far, is kind of analogous to this human convention of shaking hands. When a browser wants to request a page from a server, it sends that get request from browser to server. And then the server responds with a number, like 200, all is OK, as well as the HTML, or some bad number like 404, file not found. But meanwhile, HTTP itself isn't the internet per se. HTTP is just a service, a feature of the internet, much like Gchat is another service, much like email is another service. There's all sorts of things we can do on the internet. internet. And so HTTP is just one of those sort of applications. So on top of、um, HTTP is on top of something else, which we didn't mention by name, you might have heard of by name. TCP IP. So, the story we just told there is all about how data travels from point A to point B. And in this case, we saw at a very low level, router to router to router to router, how the data is actually being transmitted. But along the way, Um, it is going to encounter various impediments. Besides these routers, there's things called firewalls on the internet. And so, data that, such as that we were just transmitting from me to Stanford, from me to Cambridge, is sent to, at this level, something called an IP address. And we saw this a moment ago. And an IP address is just a numeric address of the form w.x.y.z, where each of these is between, give or take, 0 and 255. Though you can't quite use all of those numbers, but each of these. Placeholders is a number between 0 and 255. So an IP address these days is 32 bits. Now that gives us how many possible IP addresses in the world? Roughly 4 billion, because anytime we're counting、um, in powers of 2 all the way up to 32 of something, that usually gives us 4 billion. So that's a lot of IP addresses, but you might have read or you might now notice in the popular press a push toward a new version of IP called IPv6. Right now we're using version 4.、Uh, there really hasn't been a version 5. We're jumping right to 6. Version 6 is going to use 128 bits for IP addresses, which is freaking huge.、Um, we should not run out for quite some time now, but we have begun. To run out of version 4 IP addresses, because all of us have not only things like laptops and desktops, a lot of us have phones, a lot of us have other devices like TiVos and the like that have IP addresses themselves. Harvard itself has tens of thousands of computers, so the world is genuinely running out of IP addresses, at least of this form. So, for the next few years, you're going to see the addresses on your own computers probably slowly change as more and more companies and universities start to support the newer version. But an IP address is not sufficient for computer A. To request data from computer B, because computer B could be a server, and a server, as I mentioned earlier, can do bunches of things. It can host web pages, it can be an email server, it can be a Skype server, it can be a Gchat server. All these different、uh, services that can be provided on a server could all physically be on the same machine. So, in addition to IP addresses, the world has things called ports on the internet, and a port is just a number. So, there is a unique number for HTTP, its number is 80. Uh, HTTP also uses number 443, but more specifically for encrypted HTTP. Whenever you see the S for secure, that's using a different number.、Uh, there's other numbers like 25 is used for something called SMTP, otherwise known as email.、Uh, there's something called 22 for SSH. And there's a whole bunch of other ports out there. Now, we humans rarely see these numbers. However, When you type in an address like http colon slash slash www.facebook.com, the browser is secretly inserting 80 because you're using HTTP. If you instead type HTTPS, it's secretly inserting 443. And we can kind of see this manually. If I actually pull up a browser and go to http colon slash slash www.facebook.com. Colon 80, therefore explicitly citing not just the name of the website, but the port that I want to talk to, and hit enter. Notice it disappears because the browser assumes, oh, 80, I'm not going to even bother showing that to you by convention. But the reason for this is that if I actually wanted to send someone an email, I would really be sending it sort of to them 
on port 25, that being SMTP. So, a bit of an oversimplification, but some of you have friends、uh, who actually work at Facebook, and they similarly have servers that receive email. Anytime you send an email, what Gmail is doing for you, or Outlook, or whatever program you use, it's sort of secretly inserting that number as well, 25 in that case. So, it's this combination of IP address and number that uniquely identifies a computer on the internet and a specific service. On that computer. Now, of course, most of us have probably never typed manually an IP address, and maybe you have in the appliance, but in the real world, not so much. Why do we not actually type IP addresses into browsers? It would work. In fact, we can see this. Let me show you one other command that should work most anywhere on Harvard's campus, on a Mac or PC. There's this command called nslookup. Name server lookup. And if I look up www.cnn.com, it turns out that CNN has, oh, interesting, CNN has started using Amazon Web Services. So、um, you might know of cloud computing. Amazon's one of the big players in cloud computing. What I just did was I said, give me the address of CNN's web server. But it turns out that CNN's web server is managed by Amazon, Amazon Web Services, as this suggests. And the address of that server is apparently this here. So I'm not sure if this will work because they didn't used to use Amazon, but let's try. Try this. HTTP colon slash slash IP address, enter, and well, is it going to work? Yes, it is going to work. Internet is super slow today. But in a moment, you will see some news story. OK, a y there we go. Bank of America is being sued. All right. So,、um, This is because this IP address just happens to be synonymous with www.cnn.com. Of course, it would be horrible marketing to say, visit us on the web at 50.112.94.127. You'd never remember. So, even these days, you might recall things like 1 800-collect or sort of mnemonics the world came up with for phone numbers, which before cell phones were rather hard to remember until you could just type it in and forget about it. So, the web, too, has this convention of names and IP addresses, and there's these things out there called DNS servers. Domain name system servers that translate IP addresses into names and vice versa. So that's what's going on underneath the hood. So in the end, we have TCP IP, which is this very low level protocol that really just gets zeros and ones across the internet. And it does so by putting them essentially into a virtual envelope, if you will, and writing on the outside of the envelope the IP address of the destination as well as the numeric、uh, port number. The, of the service on that destination that it wants to talk to. Meanwhile, the, on the envelope, there's also something known as a return address, which is your IP address. So that when CNN gets a packet of information from you, opens this virtual envelope, sees that you want the home page, it knows from the sender part of this virtual envelope whom to send the HTML back to. So let's actually take a look at this in a little more detail. This is from Company called Ericsson、um, from a few years back, and they took some liberties with how the internet actually works, but it paints a much more visual picture than mere chalk up here. So I give you a bit of the internet. For the first time in history, people and machinery are working together, realizing a dream. A uniting force that knows no geographical boundaries without regard to race, creed, or color. A new era where communication truly brings people together. This is the dawn of the net. Want to know how it works? Click here 
to begin your journey into the net. Now exactly what happened when you clicked on that link? You started a flow of information. This information travels down into your own personal mailroom where Mr. IP packages it, labels it, and sends it on its way. Each packet is limited in its size. The mailroom must decide how to divide the information and how to package it. Now the package needs a label containing important information such as sender's address, receiver's address, and the type of packet it is. Because this particular packet is going out onto the internet, it also gets an address for the proxy server, which has a special function, as we'll see later. The packet is now launched onto your local area network, or LAN. This network is used to connect all the local computers, routers, printers, etc. for information exchange within the physical walls of the building. The LAN is a pretty uncontrolled place and, unfortunately, accidents can happen. The highway of the LAN is packed with all types of information. These are IP packets, Novell packets, Apple Talk packets. They're going against traffic, as usual. The local router reads the address and, if necessary, lifts the packet onto another network. Ah, the router. A symbol of control in a seemingly disorganized world. Well, sorry about that. Oh, this one here, this one here. Oh, this one's here, this one goes here. I, I don't like this one. Let's put this one here. Let's put this one here. Let's put that one here. Let's put that one here. Let's put that one here. There he is. Systematic, uncaring, methodical, conservative, and sometimes not quite up to speed. Sorry. But at least he is exact. For the most part. As the packets leave the router, they make their way into the corporate internet and head for the router switch. A bit more efficient than the router, the router switch plays fast and loose with IP packets, deftly routing them along their way. A digital pinball wizard, if you will. As packets arrive at their destination, they're picked up by the network interface, ready to be sent to the next level. In this case, the proxy. The proxy is used by many companies as sort of a middleman in order to lessen the load on their internet connection and for security reasons as well. As you can see, the packets are all of various sizes depending upon their content. The proxy opens the packet and looks for the web address, or URL. Depending upon whether the address is acceptable, the packet is sent onto the internet. There are, however, some addresses which do not meet with the approval of the proxy, that is to say corporate or management guidelines. These are summarily dealt with. We'll have none of that. For those who make it, it's on the road again. Next up, the firewall. The corporate firewall serves two purposes. 
It prevents some rather nasty things from the internet from coming into the intranet. And it can also prevent sensitive corporate information from being sent out onto the internet. Once through the firewall, a router picks up the packet and places it onto a much narrower road, or bandwidth, as we say. Obviously, the road is not broad enough to take them all. Now, you might wonder what happens to all those packets which don't make it along the way. Well, when Mr. IP doesn't receive an acknowledgement that a packet has been received in due time, he simply sends a replacement packet. We are now ready to enter the world of the Internet. A spider web of interconnected networks which span our entire globe. Here, routers and switches establish links between networks. Now, the net is an entirely different environment than you'll find within the protected walls of your LAN. Out here, it's the Wild West. Plenty of space, plenty of opportunities, plenty of things to explore and places to go. Thanks to very little control and regulation, new ideas find fertile soil to push the envelope of their possibilities. But because of this freedom, certain dangers also lurk. You'll never know when you'll meet the dreaded ping of death. A special version of a normal request ping, which some idiot thought up to mess up unsuspecting hosts. The path our packets take may be via satellite, telephone lines, wireless, or even transoceanic cable. They don't always take the fastest or shortest routes possible, but they will get there eventually. Maybe that's why it's sometimes called the worldwide wait. But when everything is working smoothly, you can circumvent the globe five times over at the drop of a hat, literally, and all for the cost of a local call or less. Near the end of our destination, we'll find another firewall. Depending upon your perspective as a data packet, the firewall could be a bastion of security or a dreaded adversary. It all depends on which side you're on and what your intentions are. The firewall is designed to let in only those packets that meet its criteria. This firewall is operating on ports 80 and 25. All attempts to enter through other ports are closed for business. Port 25 is used for mail packets, while port 80 is the entrance for packets from the internet to the web server. Inside the firewall, packets are screened more thoroughly. Some packets make it easily through customs, while others look just a bit dubious. Now, the firewall officer is not easily fooled, such as when this ping of death packet tries to disguise itself as a normal ping packet. It's okay, go on, it's okay, no problem. Have a nice day, be out of here, bye. For those packets lucky enough to make it this far, the journey is almost over. It's just a line up on the interface to be taken up into the web server. Nowadays, a web server can run on many things from a mainframe to a webcam to the computer on your desk. Or why not your refrigerator? With a proper setup, you can find out if you have the makings for chicken cacciatore or if you have to go shopping. Remember, this is the dawn of the net. Almost anything's possible. One by one, the packets are received, opened, and unpacked. The information they contain, that is, your request for information, is sent on to the web server application. The packet itself is recycled, ready to be used again, and filled with your requested information.
addressed and sent out on its way back to you. Back past the firewall, routers, and on through to the internet. Back through your corporate firewall. And on to your interface. Ready to supply your web browser with the information you requested. That is, this film. Pleased with their efforts and trusting in a better world, our trusty data packets ride off blissfully into the sunset of another day, knowing fully they have served their masters well. Now isn't that a happy ending? Okay, that's enough. We'll see you next week.